And we're back <laughs> with more of the Pope on film. Nice. Act three, money! Act three! Act three! <clears throat> Yes, buddy, my friend, it is time once again for all of us here at the Pope on Film Podcast, America's best film podcast, according to J.D. Power and Associates. Not sure how we landed that amazing guest. I saw a commercial for Verizon, and they're like, uh, Verizon, America's most dependable phone company, as voted on by J.D. Power and Associates. And it's like... Aren't you the fucking car guys? <laughs> now you just did cars. So now apparently anything can be voted on. I have the most bluest hair, according to J.D. Power and Associates. Yes. So there you go. I'm the best hair of a man my age, according to J.D. Power and Associates. Um, it's time for this podcast to drunkenly stumble upon our third and final act. And because it is said third act, because it is said third act, wherein we finally and eventually get around to discussing our high fiber, low fat, no artificial additives or preservatives movie of the week. And it's time once again for us to piss off the Scientologists watching with a look at the 2000 box office bomb to end all bombs. No, we're not talking about the Oogie Loves. It's Battlefield Earth number 20 in the IMDb list of the 100 worst movies of all time. Uh, wow, what can I say? Uh, words cannot express how amazing this film was. It was a roller coaster from start to finish. Uh, move over, Star Wars. I, I'm just, just, I'm just glad that we have an opportunity to piss off Scientologists again. It has been a while. I think it's been since the David Miscavige training video that we found and reviewed. Yeah. It's been a while since we pissed off some Scientologists, so let's really get to the nitty-gritty dirt band of this. Uh, first off, I want to say, this film came out in the year 2000, and it says something that, in its own twisted way, this film is still remembered because a lot of incredible, unforgettable films also were released that year. Highlander, Endgame, Get Carter, Dracula 2000, um, Dungeons and Dragons, Little Nicky, the live action Rocky and Bullwinkle. Oh, man. Uh, and who could forget Road Trip, which finally gave Tom Green the Oscar nomination he had been chasing since his amazing work in Freddy Got Fingered. Yes. Uh, but of all of these films, Battlefield Earth, which in my podcast notes I have uh, shortened to BFE, which I think is, is a much better name than saying Battlefield Earth. Yeah. BFE. You know? It, it, it gives the film some panache. Yes. So it says something that of all the horrible movies that came out in the year 2000, Battlefield Earth is remembered as one of the worst. Now, before before we really... But at least but compared to the rest movies, of the movies we've been covering, at least you can get a couple of yucks out of this movie. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And we'll get to that, but before we talk about our true feelings regarding Battlefield Earth, I wanted to do a little list, because I was reading reviews, and some of them hurt in a very familiar way, so I've made a list. Reviews of Battlefield Earth that could also be my dad talking to someone about me. <laughs> yes. These are all actual reviews of Battlefield Earth that could absolutely 100% also be my father talking to someone about me. So I'm really, really happy to do this. So here's the list. Appalling. A journey into the heart of rubbish. 
feel like maybe my dad might be able to break that one out. Uh, a disaster. Everything is preposterous. This is all um, tracking so far with what I know about my dad. There are many things to make fun of here. Logic is in short supply, incoherent, not awful, but pretty bad. And here's my favorite one. I'm pretty sure my dad has said this about me before. From every angle, this has been an ill-conceived project. Pretty sure my dad has said that to my mom. <laughs> about me. So, so there you go. My dad and I aren't really on speaking terms. So, so there's that. There are two reviews that I want to talk about in particular. Number one, Roger Ebert. When he was alive, his reviews of good movies were just okay, but his, remo his review of bad movies, if I could speak a little Italian here, mwah, they were great. The 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 this was the Italian part, the yes. hand gesture that I did, the Mwah! that was the Italian. Italian is like fifty percent hand gestures. Italians tend not to use as much tongue. Yeah, that's Just a good saying. point. Yeah. So uh, Roger Ebert started his review as such, and I quote. Battlefield Earth is like taking a bus trip with someone who has needed a bath for a long time. It's not merely bad, it's unpleasant in a hostile way. The visuals are grubby and drab, the characters are unkempt and have rotten teeth, breathing tubes hang from their noses like ropes of snot, the soundtrack sounds like the boom mic is being slammed against the inside of a 55 gallon drum, the plot, but let me catch my breath, this movie is off awful in so many different ways. I love that review. That really sums up Battlefield Earth well. And I was reading a lot of reviews, but I found one that warms my heart, Bunny. Yes. Brings a tear to my Mexican eye. The review is from Metroactive Movies, and it says, the easy comparisons between Battlefield Earth and Plan 9 from Outer Space have been made by everyone from A.O. Scott of the New York Times to Mr. Cranky at www.mrcranky.com. But these comparisons are unfair. Unfair to Ed Wood! Plan 9 yes. at least was a protest against nuclear proliferation. What the hell is Battlefield Earth about? Is it supposed to be a tribute to man's ingenuity? If so, why is it so shoddily built? Mm -hmm. And for that, you get a round of applause, sir. Because yes. I read a lot of reviews that said, oh, Plan 9 from Outer Space for, for a newer generation. But, oh, no, fuck you. Fuck you for all of that. Yes. Fucker. You mean to tell me Barry Pepper isn't even near the title of the movie? But, I mean, Voltas, you know, it's based on an L. Ron Hubbard book, so exactly what were people expecting? That's a good point. That's a good point. It's like before Cats came out, and I was really excited because at being a theater person way back in the day, I was excited that all of the planet would know what theater people have always known which is that the musical Cats is a muddled piece of shit. <laughs> the musical Cats is the wet cat of musicals. <laughs> and so, yeah, what were you expecting with a movie based on an L. Ron Hubbard book? Were you expecting fucking Gil Good from this shit? I mean, goddamn. So, Bunny, um, as I said earlier, in the podcast. Um, if anyone is new 
to this podcast. Let me tell you a fact. Um, Bunny actually moved to Colorado because he's such a big fan of the movie Battlefield Earth that he wanted to be closer to the setting of the film. Yes. So, I'm pretty sure. I, I They should have added a scene where... Uh, I think we found some gold. It's here in a in a tunnel. Wait a second, this is fake gold. What is this? Pan back. It's the ruined remains of Casa Bonita. <laughs> and they were actually they thought they had found gold, but it was just a Black Bart's cave. Yes. And scene right there. That's the end of the film. Just major ending. So um here's the thing um i'm gonna give this movie a a better review than it deserves i'm not saying this is a good movie this is a bad movie did you let a cat out okay good. huh just move it the middle is Normal. The one side is hot, one side is cold. You can do it. I believe in you. I believe in you, Jaden. So, um, I'm not saying the movie is good. The movie is bad. What I'm saying is I had fun watching this horrible movie. And it's the first time this summer. Yeah. That I've, that we've watched one of these bad movies from the IMDb Bottom 100 where I can laugh at it. Yes. And have a bit of fun with. Yeah, Slender Man was just fucking boring. That was barely a movie. What else did we do? Um, Castaway was an affront to humanity. What was it? Swept Away. Swept Away. Not, not Cast Away. Sorry that I said that, Wilson. You're still my best friend. But what other movies did we see this summer? I'm even having a hard time paying attention. Dungeons and Dragons. But this See, now, movie is I, I one of the good, bad movies. I yeah. I, I haven't read the book, but with John Travolta being so behind this movie, I have to assume that it's a fairly, re a fairly accurate representation of the book. So we okay. got to start right there where the plot is just fucking stupid. Okay. I'm glad you brought that up. Oh, I've got popcorn stuck in my tongue. Okay. So, the first screenwriter for this movie was a guy named J.D. Shapiro. He actually wrote the script for Robin Hood Men in Tights. Okay. He didn't like organized religion, and he certainly didn't like Scientology, but he started hanging out around the Scientology headquarters in Hollywood because he heard it was a good place to pick up actor chicks. Yeah. So he would hang out by Scientology, and one day someone just said, like, hey, you're a screenwriter? Um, we're looking for a screenwriter to write the Battlefield Earth movie and he didn't want to do it and everyone told him not to do it because oh these Scientologists it's crazy it's a cult and he's like yeah but I'll do it and he's meeting with John Travolta and oh you've got to write the script you've got to write the script and so when he wrote the script he wasn't so beholden to the novel he read the novel and he's like okay this is a good okay, start okay, wait, 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 wait 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 I think we went over a point here way too hmm. fast. Okay? Okay. So basically what you're telling me here is that the screenwriter for Battlefield Earth also is wrote a screenwriter Robin Robin. that the Scientologist just found in the street one day and hired. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. He was just hanging around, and they just picked him and said, "Hey, you're a screenwriter. Come and write this." But I haven't gotten to the to the main. So point. if they he met a screenwriter in a Seven Eleven, might have been a whole different movie. Yes, but here's the thing. Notice I said first screenwriter. 
That's yeah. an important caveat to the story because he he read the book and said, okay, this is a good starting off point, but a lot of this is cheesy and a lot of this is weird and none of no one will find this believable even for a uh, science fiction story. So I will use this as a basis and come up with another a story like it, one that's grittier and darker and have a more serious tone and stray from the book. And he wrote a good script. And so they took his script and they were going to go ahead with it. But eventually John Travolta and Scientology went, okay, this script, it needs to be more like L. Ron Hubbard's book. It needs to be more like Scientology. So they hired a bunch of other screenwriters to get his what could have been a decent script and turned that into the crap that we saw. But... Uh, J.D. Shapiro's name was still stuck to that movie, and he said, I gotta get this name off, I gotta get this name off, and they said, no, you're, we're gonna put a uh, screenplay by J.D. Shapiro and other people, but your name is gonna be right there up on the top, and he was really ashamed of that for the longest time. He even openly apologized for having his name attached to this film, but he had a really good, uh, um, like, uh, you know, he, 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 had a, he was a jovial spirit, and he accepted his Razzie personally. Yeah. He was there to accept the Razzie for, like, um, worst film of the decade, I think. And he was there, and, he, and he, he has a perverse pride of it now because it's like, hey, at least you were able to say that you wrote a screenplay that was the best at something, and this movie just happened to be the best at being the worst. But there's still a perverse pride in saying, hey, you were the best somewhere. Yeah. You know? <coughs> and so, so, yeah. So he wrote a decent script that was fucked up by the actual Scientologists. That was a story that I learned in my research. But I gotta say, the film was stupid and dumb, but oh man. Um, it was so bad, it was hilarious. John Travolta looks like he's having fun. He has the Daryl Cornelius Grouch the Third. He was the Kelsey Grammer in Money Plane of Battlefielder. Oh, God, he was. He was chewing up the scenery a lot. But he also seemed like he was doing an impersonation of somebody, and I can't think of who that somebody is. Uh, I see it as being he was alien snidely whiplash. Yeah, is how I kinda. thought. Yeah, it's that his character should have also had a top hat and a twirly mustache that he could twirl around while he was saying his uh, soliloquies. Yeah, but now John Travolta is the big bad guy of this movie. Okay. But if we think about this, he sent, yeah. he sent to Earth. You know, that's like being stationed on Tatooine. You know? You are not yeah. important if you get sent to Earth, even in a command position. You know? Yeah. And... So, He's responsible so the bad guy for his is, whole planet being destroyed? I mean, John Travolta is basically the assistant manager you worked with who took the idea of being a, an assistant manager way fucking too seriously. Yeah. That's John Travolta's character. He's a step oh, so you're a saying stock that, boy. So you're saying... <laughs> You're saying basically that Battlefield Earth is the office in space and John Travolta was the Dwight Schrute. Is that what you're saying? Basically, yes. Yeah. Okay. Dwight Schrute in space. And that yeah. leads to his home world being destroyed. That sounds like a... That's real Don Knox energy. Yeah. That's a real Don Nazian move of the head cyclone. Cy cyclone? I wrote it down somewhere, like, but also I don't want to like, look for it. 
Nobody back home on Cyclo ever saw this coming. <laughs> yeah. The movie should have ended with the music from the end credits of Curb Your Enthusiasm. A middle... Do -do -do. Do -do -do -do. That's, that's how the film should have ended. A middle management suck-up fucks up his job so bad he got his planet destroyed. Yeah, basically, yeah. Do you, do you think you could uh, tackle the plot for us, Bunny? Uh, not terribly sure. Uh, there is a pack of caveman-esque humans who don't know that their world has been invaded by aliens. Like, this is fucking news to them. Yeah, they think uh, it's a demon. Huh? Yeah. They think that it's like demons. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and our hero gets captured by one of them and brought back to their camp and There's a planet in the ape, suit, ape scene where they're eating mush, and they get into a fight, and yep. he became he becomes the chief ape. A uh, lot of lot of grunting, lot of loincloths. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And, and like there's no there's no story in this portion because he was just taken as they would take any of them no no big deal. Uh, John Travolta comes up with a scheme that if he treat if he teaches the human animals, which I thought was a funny way of putting it, very much so. Uh. Because why human animals? Why are you calling them man animals? You know, do you... Do yeah. You, do you, uh, are you calling it dog dog? Or, you know... It's not yeah. making sense. Call, call them humans, call them man. Huh? But anyway. Yeah. But anyway. So he decides he's going to take a bunch of them and he's going to teach them how to mine gold. And he's not going to have to tell anybody, so he gets to keep the gold all on his own. And and he, like, their society, it's, it's a basic capitalist system. You know, the Cylons, yeah. the, the, the Cyclons are Cyclons. really, are, are just an extreme of, they're where we're at. You know, we weren't yeah. quite there when Battlefield Earth came out, but we're fucking there now. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Where they're just blackmailing each other to to make better deals and get more money and everybody's out to screw everybody and you know, that's that's America right now. Yeah. You know. So I you saw... won't have to tell he won't have to tell home office. You know, and yeah. are we really to believe that home office is home office all of Cyclone? Is it home yeah. office of this whole planet? No, it's the home office of Walmart. They're Walmart. Yeah. Because that's all this is. John Travolta, assistant manager at Walmart in a, in a, in a shop on Earth. That's it. That's who yeah. he is. Uh, so they put a device on on our captured native guy, Johnny. Johnny. What Johnny was his last boy. name? Johnny Goodfellow? Good body? Slim body? Johnny Goodfellow. all the external boy. organs on this know. suit? Huh? I don't remember what the last name is, and I don't want to look it up because then I would have to put effort into Battlefield Earth. But 
really, the point I'm getting to there is like, they have forgotten about the invading force of aliens that have taken over their planet and forced them to live like animals. That slips in, slips their mind. Yeah. But the name yeah. Johnny survives? Yeah, that's a bit weird. That's a bit sus, now that you mention it. And with a last name, Goodfellow whatever the fuck it is. Yeah, Johnny Goodboy something. Johnny I'm surprised Goodboy. it's not Freeman. I remember seeing this in like 2003, 2004, but I just remember, I remember it being one of those things of, oh, you 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 founded the Church of Ed Wood? Oh, so you've seen Battlefield Earth, right? So many people try to be like, oh, you like bad movies? Have you seen Blank? You haven't? Oh, you have to watch this. I remember being forced to watch Battlefield Earth in like 2003 or four or something like that, but I just remember being bored by it, but... Now, looking back at it, I think it's because when I watched it, I was too close to the actual time that it came out and remember Battlefield Earth toys on shelves and stuff yeah. like that. Like Battle Earth cups available at Circle K or 7-Eleven or whatever. You know Circle K isn't Circle K anymore? Pissed off about this. Pissed off, I say pissed off. Circle K is not Circle K anymore? No, uh, they were bought by another company, and so Circle K have, in America at least, Circle K have all been changed, and now they're called, uh, Casey's, I believe. Really? Uh, yeah, the, uh... Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're slowly but surely changing the name of all of the Circle Ks. Huh. It, it's very upsetting. All of the Circle Ks here in the state are now uh, Casey's, I believe. It, it pisses me off, but that's beside the point. I so, think so when I saw the film Volta first... takes this guy and puts him in a smart machine so he can learn how to mine... And then he releases them so that he can go back to his friends so John Travolta can capture them too and make them smart. So making a pack of humans smart, there's nothing wrong with this plan. Perfect plan. Yep. Proof. Nothing could go wrong here. No problems. <coughs> no problems at all. So they get smart, they learn how to use the smart machine, they get smarter, and they get smart enough to figure out how to blow up another fucking planet. Yeah. They get that smart. Out of yeah. loincloths and, I don't know, maybe belly button lint? Um, that's all the technology they had access to. And then, like, they're in Fort Knox preparing f for a fight, the humans and the cyclone, whatever the fuck. And so they ha so our hero, Johnny, has the other humans going through, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, the army training and they're going through a, a, a flight simulator and it's like oh well that's interesting I wonder how they got electricity to run a flight simulator when it's the year 3000 and everything's been fucking destroyed but whatever yeah I don't know why I'm thinking about logic in an L. Ron Hubbard story but okay <laughs> fun in the simulator everything works perfectly Books are still fine. It's a thousand years. Yeah. Yeah, they haven't crumbled to dust at all. And seriously, yeah. how okay. incredibly technical advanced to 
or superior or anything else. Are these cyclos? And they somehow managed to overlook Fort fucking Knox? Yeah. 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 The Ferengi would have been on that shit in a fucking second. Yeah. The second that ship landed, it would have landed on Fort Knox. Absolutely. 100%. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So they're not even good at being the kind of evil they're supposed to be. Yeah. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Okay. So. Uh, I want to talk about the making of this film. And how it was all a scam. Okay. All of it. The writing of the book. The success of the book. The turning it into a movie. The movie that we watched. The whole thing was just a scam from start to finish. So, let's talk about it. L. Ron Hubbard, science fiction author, pulp uh, science fiction magazines, and then he wrote the bullshit book Dianetics in 1950. In 1952, he lost the rights to his own book, and so he created Scientology. He basically created a religion around the book that he lost the rights to. Uh, fun fact, I read this on Twitter. QAnon is Scientology for people who can't afford to go up the bridge. <laughs> I really yeah. like that analogy. Yeah. It's that really makes sense. good. Yeah. So then in 1970, Operation Snow White happened. Scientology had 5,000 secret agents infiltrate 136 government agencies so that they could steal records regarding Scientology from the U.S. government. And so basically, and that combined with a bunch of other uh, countries starting to crack down on the nonsensical bullshit of Scientology, led uh, L. Ron Hubbard to found the Sea Org, a sea organization so that he could cowardly free persecution in international waters. And Operation Snow White is not talked about as much as it should. I'm sorry, but Scientology is a terrorist organization because they attacked the United States. Yes. Operation Snow White was basically a January 6th insurrection, but no one died. And it pisses me off that Scientology is not seen as an enemy to this nation. As it should. As it should. Yeah. So, uh... It, it just shows you how much rich white people can get away with. You know? Just goes to show you. In 1975, L. Ron Hubbard returned to the United States and lived a secluded life in his massive Corleone family type estate. He wasn't writing, he hadn't written for a long time, he was focusing on the religion. Until 1982, four years before his death of, oh, I'm sorry to see this, he died of small penis disease. Didn't even know that was a thing, I guess he, it was a okay. Or so I've heard, I read that on the internet. L. Ron Hubbard was going back to writing, he wrote a big callback pulp science fiction epic called Battlefield Earth, and uh, oh look, uh, L. Ron Hubbard, the pulp magazine author is back, and his book BFE climbed to the top of the bestseller list, but uh, I have said this before on this podcast at length you have no reason to trust the New York Times bestseller list because yeah. anybody can get on the New York Times bestseller list as long as you have enough money to purchase your own book in bulk. Oh, Donald Trump Jr., number one book on the New York Times nonfiction bestseller list. Yeah, Republicans buy mass copies of Republican-written books to guarantee it being a bestseller. It's very easy to have a bestseller if you have the money to make it happen. And a lot of booksellers all over America have 
tales of the bulk orders of, hey, there's this new book coming out, and then you get a call from an organization, and, oh, I need 1,500 copies of this book. And it's a pain in the ass. So, yeah, uh, Battlefield Earth was a bestseller because Scientology bought the book on bulk. Oh, we need 5,000 copies here at the Hollywood Center to give out as prizes. And, oh, look, every other Scientology Center is also buying mass copies of the book. And also, look at this. Scientology Centers are actually trying to press its members to purchase bulk copies of the book to give out to family and friends. And, oh, look, I work at a Walden Books at the mall, and suddenly all of these people are buying nine copies of uh, L. Ron Hubbard's new book. So, uh, yeah, uh, the whole thing was 100% bullshit. Oh, yeah, the concept of Battlefield Earth based on the best-selling book. Oh, no, that's total bullshit. And that's total bullshit. It was a best-selling book because Scientology made it a best-selling book and not because yeah. it sold a bunch... But it's fucking 1982, and people don't fully understand that yet. And so L. Ron Hubbard is able to walk the streets and be like, yes, I'm back. L. Ron Hubbard, successful author, once again. Oh, yeah, studios have been contacting me. Well, when, All when of the big the, ones. When, are, are we talking about, like, a re-release on the book? Because didn't the book come out, like, quite a bit earlier? Like, early No, I looked it up. I looked yeah. that shit up. Yeah. Battlefield Earth, a saga of the year 3000, is a 1982 science fiction novel written by L. Ron Hubbard. He also composed a soundtrack to the book called Space Jazz. <laughs> The soundtrack to the book, Battlefield Earth, and he got all of the famous jazz people who were also Scientologists to be in it. So, like, Stanley Clark was on bass, Chick Corea was on keyboards, and apparently it's called, it's known as one of uh, the worst jazz albums in the history of jazz music, which says a lot, because it's jazz! Yeah. Yeah. So I was shocked. I thought it came out in the 60s or 70s, but no. 1982 fucking book. Yeah. 1982. I, yeah, but that, yeah, that, see, I, I just thought it was an older book, but that kind of makes sense because I had first heard of it uh, when I was commuting in and out from the city to work, and that'd be around 82, 83. Did it for a little while. Uh, and a friend of mine was like a voracious science fiction reader, you know, and yeah. most of most of his stuff came from like that sixty-ish, you know, like Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, yeah. you know, the hardcore shit, Heinlein, you know, yeah, and and he had read it and he he hated it. <laughs> But I just, because of that, that's why I thought it was like a much older book. Yeah, I, so did I. I was shocked to see it came out in 82. But uh, because people don't realize how easy it is to cheat the New York Times bestseller list, the uh, fucking L. Ron Hubbard is walking around, hey, you know, yeah, it, it's amazing being a best-selling author again all of the major hollywood studios have been contacting me all of the big ones i've already written three screenplays people are saying it's going to be the next star wars i've heard that numerous times it's going to be the next star wars i'm definitely not a liar why would i lie to you i have a number one best-selling book yeah this is going to be the next star wars and in 1985 they were working on making a low budget version of it but it went nowhere and hubbard died soon afterwards Enter our boy, John freaking Travolta. He joined Scientology early in 75. Yeah. That is astounding. Yeah, he's been and, there for a real long time. Yeah, and so he was, you know, John Travolta was big in the 70s. When L. Ron Hubbard was still alive and before his death, after writing Battlefield Earth, but before his death, L. Ron Hubbard himself said, 
I hope John Travolta eventually makes a Battlefield Earth movie. Oh, okay. That's going to be difficult to hear your savior say. Yeah. So John Travolta always wanted to make the movie, but the problem was he was always like mid-tier, but he was never a major star. And then, boom, here comes the freaking 80s. Thanks, Tarantino. <laughs> this movie is your fault. So then he <coughs> fixed him, get shorty, face off, primary color. Suddenly he was a major player, and in 1995... Uh, he's there with his uh, managers and, and everything, and they're like, please, John, don't make this movie. You can't make this movie. You you do not want to make this movie. And John Travolta's like, my entire career throughout the 70s and 80s, I've wanted, I, I've wanted to, to, you know, since this book came out, I've been wanting to do a movie. The author himself said I should make this movie, and I've been waiting and now that I'm one of the biggest stars in America, if I don't do it now, then it'll never happen. We need to do it. So in 1995, he announces that he is uh, working at his hardest to, to make the movie. But no studio wanted it. No studio at all. But, oh, bunny, let me tell you the amazing story of franchise pictures. <laughs> ah, I love this story. The head of Franchise Pictures was a former dry cleaning mogul and nightclub owner. So, nice. oh yeah, Real class act. Real class act. Uh, well, right off the name, I laughed when I saw Franchise Pictures. Yes, it's like did. it's like Franchise Pictures, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like that's really being like positive. I guess I don't know. I found it really fucking yeah. weird. Yeah. Franchise pictures specialized in making pet projects for stars on a low budget that would guarantee a financial success on name alone. Because all of these big Hollywood stars always have their pet project, their little vanity project, the one thing that they want to do. And hey, this studio turned it down, this studio turned it down, this studio turned it down. And Sylvester Stallone in his mansion is going, oh man, everyone's doing a Pulp Fiction ripoff. I want to do a Pulp Fiction style crime movie too, but no one wants to finance my movie. And then knock, knock, knock. Hey, how you doing? We're franchise pictures. We would love to make the movie Get Carter for you, Mr. Stallone. Of course, you'll have to agree to a reduced pay because really, Stallone, we're doing you a favor here. So Stallone, who's making, you know, $15 million a picture is like, oh, finally a studio wants to make my movie. Sure, I'll make it at a reduced price. And that's how a major studio gets a major player to make a movie for such a small amount of money that Get Carter comes out. And even if it's a bomb, Franchise Pictures is still making money. Yeah. And so a lot of the movies that they did were not the best, but they found a way to trick people into, oh, Kevin Costner and Kurt Russell want to do a crime caper where the Elvis impersonators. No actual fucking studio will make this stupid movie. How you do it? Franchise pictures. We'll gladly make 3,000 miles to Graceland for you. Of course, Kevin <laughs> Costner and Kurt Russell, you'll have to agree to a pay decrease because, you know, we're doing you a favor here. And that is the story of franchise pictures, right? They make vanity projects that studios won't touch, and they found a way to, you know, to to kind of, sort of, scam celebrities into making a decent amount of change for, for their studio. Uh, did you know that Steve Buscemi made a neo-noir crime film sent in San Quentin called Animal Factory? No. It was an early uh, uh, co-starring role for Danny Trejo. No studio wanted to touch it. How you doing, Steve? Uh, franchise Pictures. We'd love to do this movie that no one will see because uh, if we've got you as a writer, director, and star, we're guaranteed to make a, a hit as long as you agree to a pay decrease. And that's the story of Franchise Pictures. Here are some other film movie films that franchise pictures made uh the caveman's valentine 
You remember that film? Samuel Jackson is like a homeless guy in the park and witnesses a murder. I remember oh. that film. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, uh, The Caveman's Valentine. Fear.com? That I had seen. Uh, the whole That had the yards. crying game guy. Yeah, yeah, that movie. That movie, yeah. The whole nine yards, ballistics, X versus Sever, and a little film you probably haven't heard of called The Bone Duck Saints. Really? That was franchise pictures, yeah. They also made a David Mamet crime film called Heist, which starred Gene Hackman, Delroy Lindo, and Danny DeVito who were all in Get Shorty, and they did a crime film together, written and directed by David Mamet, which ended up being the highest grossing film ever directed by David Mamet in the US. But anyway, that's Franchise Pictures. Franchise Pictures, it, John Travolta's in his uh, uh, Scientology pod, I don't fucking know. And he's like, man, none of these studios want to make Battlefield or... How you doing? Hey, Franchise Pictures, we will gladly make your Battlefield Earth movie. Of course, John Travolta, you'll have to make a, a significant pay cut to be in this, but hey, we're going to make it. Don't worry about it. We promise this isn't a scam. So they make Battlefield Earth. Travolta wanted to star in the film. But he was too old by the time he got it off the, the, he actually got filming. So he sadly had to be the bad guy in it, which I think is why he's acting so fucking insane because he really wanted to be fucking Johnny. Okay. Hey, come on guys, I could still be Johnny. That's not a good Travolta, but I feel like it still has a taste of Travolta. Yeah. A hint. A taste of Travolta. A hint. Yeah. An yeah. essence, a sprinkling of Travolta. A, a smattering of Travolta. Yeah. A smattering of Travolta. Also, uh, John Travolta... That, okay, wait, 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 wait. If we ever get him for a porn, that's the title. A smattering of Travolta? A smattering of Travolta. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm down with that. Travolta contacted Tarantino and asked him if he wanted to direct Battlefield Earth. Yeah. Wow, I bet I bet Tarantino loses sleep over missing so, uh, this. You know? <laughs> Tarantino is like, ah, oh, Battlefield Earth. The one that got away. Yeah. I'm happy. That, I'm happy that Tarantino didn't make Battlefield Earth because I wouldn't have wanted to have seen so many close-ups of John Travolta's alien feet. Well, if you, and if you think about it, Travolta really hasn't been in any other Tarantino movies, has he? No, he absolutely has not, and that's especially, what Tarantino does. That's that's a lot. Especially since, yeah, Tarantino loves recycling people. Yeah. So that does say a lot. I and imagine seems, in the... in the And it seems to me like actors are like kind of pulled into the Tarantino zone. Kind of like a black hole. You know? Yeah. Because it was smaller yeah. people. It was John Travolta. It was Samuel L. Jackson who was not nearly as big then as he is now. Uh, you know, people I don't know. Like who this, can forget but... when Amos and Andrew uh, fandom swept the nation? <laughs> I remember. And then he started sucking <laughs> in now DiCaprio and Brad Pitt and people like this yeah. that he, he is now reusing in his movie. So he's like, everybody will sue. Tarantino will sooner or later absorb the Marvel Universe. Yeah, I'm alright with that. I'm alright with that. I don't know. Uh, I still feel that Tarantino is just always six inches away from a Me Too reckoning. <laughs> yes. I, yes. I and just, really just, do. Like, I know the feet thing. I know the foot thing. Like, I understand that, but also, like... 
you were best friends with Harvey Weinstein, and you just seem like someone who has definitely snorted something off of the some part of someone. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Travolta, uh, uh, Tarantino seems like the type of person who definitely has his favorite flavor of lube. <laughs> One thousand percent sure about that. Yeah. Never been sure of it in my life. So when I was watching Battlefield Earth this week, I was imagining Tarant- Quentin Tarantino's Battlefield Earth, and I had a lot of fun with that. What is this primitive human machine you have brought me? I am not sure. I think the humans called it a record player. Well, let's see if it works. Well, I don't know why I came here tonight. And that's how he gets the soundtrack in the movie. Yeah. That's how Tarantino gets all of the songs in there, because it's not a Tarantino song without old-ass music, so that's how you get it. So, uh, so they're they're making Battlefield Earth. This is out of out of all the weird stories that I that I like doing my deep dive into Battlefield Earth. This is one of my favorites. An old newspaper called Mean Magazine managed to get their hands on the a copy of the script when they when they just finished shooting and they went into post production this alternative uh, newspaper mean magazine got a copy of the script and they said this is what we'll do we'll take the cover page off and we'll give it a different name and a different author and we'll we'll shop it around to all of the studios and so they did. They gave it a different name, a different author, and they circulated it to every major studio, and they all laughed at it. Quote, this script is, is as entertaining as watching a fly breathe. The script reeks of unoriginality. It is full of ham-fisted dialogue. It is so bad, no one would ever touch it. And so even before the movie came out, there was a buzz of, ooh, this is going to be horrible. So Battlefield Earth comes in a bomb, event, and, and Franchise Pictures just keeps releasing these like mid-tier crappy movies. And... Uh, uh, Battlefield Earth bombs, and then that's the end of it. But the people who worked on Battlefield Earth are starting to think about it, and they're like, hey, so I was the cameraman. I was the one who did all of the, the, the colored filters and all the Dutch angles of, like, everything's yeah. in a corner th- throughout the entire movie. You see the entire film like this. That I did that. And I did that because... This film had the lowest camera budget of any film I've ever done. It's like the movie had no budget. And I'm confused about that because Franchise Pictures was all over the place saying, oh, uh, with a budget over $75 million, but here I am, the cameraman, and I'm forced to do all of these touch angles and all of these camera filters because I have no money to do anything. Thing. I can't light the damn thing. I can barely film the damn thing. Where has the money gone? And all of these other people in the, who worked on the film are thinking, yeah, you know what? Our catering budget was absolute shit. We were so badly fed that John Travolta f- uh, flew in his own private chefs to feed everyone. And I'm really thankful to that. Apparently, John Travolta is a really nice guy in person. But where did the catering budget go? Yeah, you know what? I was working on the props of this film, and we had to work with so little money that we were going to junkyards and and trying to build things to make this a science fiction universe because we had no money. And people start thinking about that. Uh, Start thinking about that budget number. So many people start doing rumblings that in 2002, the FBI starts probing franchise pictures and oh my god the court case is such a story but the long and short of it is in making a battlefield earth franchise pictures set a 75 million dollar budget 
but the budget was actually for the four million and a lot of that went directly into Travolta's pocket. So in actuality, the director was working on a budget of twenty four million, twenty one million dollars and the seventy five million dollars that franchise pictures claimed if that was pocketed by franchise and the court, the U.S. Uh, court said that this was fraud and franchise had to pay in court and boom, they went into bankruptcy in 2007. So the success of Battlefield Earth was a scam. Uh, L. Ron Hubbard saying, oh, this is going to be such a successful movie. He was lying. That was a scam. Oh, all the studios are talking to me. They say Battlefield Earth is going to be the next Star Wars. That was all a scam. John Travolta makes, wants to make the movie and teams up with Franchise Pictures, who then scammed them while making Battlefield Earth. So this is a scam movie based on a scam novel. It's Scamception. <laughs> <laughs> and nice. I love the fact that L. Ron Hubbard was a scam artist and he wrote this book which was a scam bestseller and oh what beautiful delicious irony that when Scientology finally made the movie they were scammed yes the yes. biggest scammers in the world were scammed that is fucking wonderful and I absolutely love that so much uh, fun fact as a hardcover book uh, Battlefield Earth is almost 800 pages and in paperback it's well over a thousand pages long and so it's impossible to accurately make the book as one film and so the movie that we just watched was just the first half of the actual novel and franchise pictures had already announced battlefield earth 2 for 2002 it was uh, scheduled to be released at the same time as one of the star wars prequels because okay. Travolta was still like, oh, well, L. Ron Hubbard said that Battlefield Earth was going to be the next Star Wars. So when we release the sequel, we're releasing it head to head with one of the Star Wars prequels. And we're going to take George Lucas down. But the FBI put an end to Battlefield Earth 2. Fuck. <laughs> Goddamn, they cock blocked us from getting more Battlefield Earthies. Okay, so so here's the thing that I find fascinating. So the bad guy aliens are called cyclos? Cyclos. Yep. Cyclons. Cyclos, okay. Yeah. So L. Ron Hubbard wrote the book Dianetics in 1950, and it's all total bullshit about unlocking the powers of the mind. And our minds are powerful, but we don't have access to the entirety of our mind because our souls and our mental energy are being blocked by these negative uh, events in our life called engrams that we need to clear by a process called auditing and it's all a lie written by a pulp magazine author and college dropout with no experience in health science psychology or anything yeah. and so after it's released the American Psychological Association had to come out and say okay didn't know we had to do this but uh, Dianetics is bullshit didn't think we had to say this didn't think anyone would fall for this, but fuck, this is not based on facts. None of this is real. And that hurt L. Ron Hubbard's feelings so bad that when he went on to create Scientology, he said, okay, this is a religion now. Let me tell you who the number one enemy is. Psychiatrists! <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, L. Ron Hubbard is Donald Trump. I'm the president now, so you all have to listen to me. I'm the most popular president of all time. And the media said, um, the president just lied. And Donald Trump said, okay, we have an enemy. And it's the media, those lying bastards. It's fake news. They're the enemy of America and not me. Because yeah. the media hurt Donald Trump's little feelings. Donald Trump is basically L. Ron Hubbard, but he was more successful at the scale. So and a brief Battle moment on engrams. I do want to remind everybody that engrams 
was featured in a particular episode of the original Star Trek. I forget what the episode name was, but it was the one that had William Marshall in it, who had built a computer that would run the Enterprise without a crew. And it was run yes. by Program Engrams. Huh. <clears throat> there you go. Okay. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, L. Ron Hubbard is a total lying piece of shit. So in the book, the bad guys are the Cyclones, but in the book, they go into more detail about the Cyclones' uh, origins in history, and the Cyclones are ruled by a higher class of aliens called the Catrices who are described as an evil group of charlatans. So it's the Cyclones and the Catrasists. So together they form the Cyclocatrasists, who are evil charlatans. I'm surprised the hero wasn't named Truman. Yeah. Truman Freeman good guy. Yeah. Because Jesus, L. Ron Hubbard, you're really, you're not going for subtlety here. No. Anyway, uh, this film is is pretty bad, but uh, John Travolta is hilarious. And the ending, where there's all the science fiction planes, and then they suddenly the humans show up in like fucking B fifty twos and shit. I thought to myself when that scene happened, if I was twelve, I would mark the fuck out from this. Yeah. Like, that is pretty cool. But then again, that was L. Ron Hubbard saying, I'm going to write a fucking old school, stupid pulp novel, and that's exactly the sort of thing that you would find in some book you paid 65 cents from, for. Yeah. At like, uh, you know? But I don't, I liked Battlefield Earth. It's, it's so bad. It is so bad that I had fun with it, at least more than any of the other damn movies we saw this, we've seen this year. It's been a freaking... It's been difficult watching the movies that we have had to watch. Slender Man was horrible. Bratz was a fucking piece of shit. Spice World. Uh, Wicker Man. Yeah. I'd rather watch Battlefield Earth than have to watch uh, fucking Wicker Man again. Dungeons and Dragons... I'm going through my notebooks. Oh, fucking Street Fighter. Oh, yeah. Oh, swept away. At least this is finally the first one we've watched that is at least so bad that, like, I have fun uh, watching this dumbass piece of shit. I loved. Yeah. I, I laughed out loud at the scene where fucking Barry Pepper is like, we have mined gold for you, and John Travolta picks up these, like, Fort Knox fucking... Why are they in bar form? <laughs> and, like, I laughed out loud at that. That was so fucking stupid. Oh, because we know that the Cyclones would uh, prefer it not to be in its on fucking yeah, I, it, it was a really stupid movie, and I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah. And I'm, I, I'm really thinking that from here on out, because this movie was is number 20 on the IMDb bottom 100 list of the 100 worst movies of all time. I'm pretty sure from here on out, we're going to be watching stupid movies that are going to be fun. Okay. We can hope. Fingers crossed. Because it has been yeah. rough. It has been a rough ass time. It has been a rough <coughs> ass time. So, and you okay. know what? And you know what? I'm sorry. Why? But I blame Tim Curry. Yeah. Yeah. I 100 percent blame Tim Curry. Okay. So, uh, so that's all I've got for this week's movie, uh, Battlefield Earth. The funny thing is, is that throughout this entire discussion of Battlefield Earth. I repeatedly forgot the name of the movie and had to check my notes. I did it just now. So that's been our movie, um, Battlefield Earth. <coughs> yeah. And like, you know that's a sign of a bad movie when you're forgetting the name of the movie. 
Yeah. So, uh, so next week, the results have been finalized. We got 17 votes. Oh, coming in dead last was the movie Son of the Mask. Coming in in second place was from Justin to Kelly. And next week, an historic moment for this podcast. We are watching our first Uwe Bull film with his movie adaptation of the video game Alone in the Dark starring Christian Slater and featuring Tara Reid in the part she was born to play, a scientist. Oh, I'm pretty excited. We can get Yui Bolt to box us. Do you think we can get Yui Bolt to box us? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. That's the goal for next week. To piss him off so much that he threatens to box us like he has done with so many other actual critics of his films. Now now that can match what pay to watch. Yeah. What year did this movie come out? Because this this movie sounds like a cry for help. You know, this sounds like a couple of actors that really need to jumpstart their career again. So it came out in two, this. Huh? It came out at the end of January 2005. It stars Christian Slater, Stephen Dorff. Oh. And Tara Reid. Okay, okay. Uh, Since you mentioned Stephen Dorff, okay, as we watch this movie, please keep in mind that he feels he is too good to be in a Black Widow movie or any Marvel oh, movie. Jesus the star but he of was Space in. Truckers. That's, Space that's Truckers. Beneath him. Yeah. And I might be mistaken, but I believe this is the film where they add scenes from the actual video game into the movie. I mean, like, literally showing... It might not be this one. It might be one of the other ones that he did. But anyway, yeah, this is considered to be one of, if not the worst film ever made. And it's our first Yui Bowl film, so that's going to be exciting. Also... So next uh, week, we're going to be dis- discussing uh, the number four worst film of all time, a Turkish propaganda film. We're going to be talking about the Erdogan okay. uh, regime in Turkey. It's going to get serious. And also, WWE news. There's a lot of professional wrestling news out there. We're going to be tackling that. Get your pizza cutters ready for next week. It's going to be uh, a really exciting episode next week. But now that I'm getting, now that I'm, uh, now that we're at the end of this week, oh man, it has been a roller coaster. Daniel Kubelbach, M. Night Shyamalan. The SPCSCPG, uh, John Travolta. Oh man, I gotta say, I think this has been a pretty good episode. Oh look, funny. Look, uh, uh, nice. I've been writing. I've been writing uh, the podcast on notebooks lately, and I got a bunch of stickers from uh, a 420, uh, like. 420 of Palooza party. So I got all of these stickers from different uh, uh, companies. And look, I got a Keef on the back. Cool. I got a Keef sticker. That has fucked us up. Fucked us both up. Yes, I love it. Does. That. I love that so much. I gotta say, I think this has been a pretty darn good episode of the podcast. I think it's been a damn good episode. Okay, good. I felt the same way, but I didn't want to step on your toes because I feel that you're the person who makes that distinction and not me. So it's not it's not within my power. It's not within my authority. You know, you got the wrong guy. I'm the dude. But yes, I concur with your assessment, good sir. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. 
And I am Reverend Steven on behalf of Maxwell and Natasha and Bella and the kittens and everybody else in the house. I just want to say thanks for listening and we will see you next week, you godless heathens. And you do sparkles and And you evil psychiatrists. Nice. Way to remember the whole theme of the of the podcast. We're waiting to really tie it in a bow, Maxwell. Bringing it home. Bringing it around. Bringing it around town. Do you remember what I said? You said, uh, you said something about Maxwell. Yeah. Maxwell, you said something about the dumb movie about evil psychiatrists. About how psychiatrists are evil, yeah. 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 Uh, do, 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 do. Do 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 skiddy bop do wow and break and cut cut and print. Okay, I interrupt the cut because I forgot to mention one rather important thing <laughs> that yes. July was our most listened month ever. That no has not happened shit. in quite wow. a while. Probably, probably all Spice Girls fans, right? That's what probably. I'm guessing. Probably. Fans of Spice Girls and Julia Goldani Tellis, the star of Slender Man. Her fan base really came through. Uh, hey, thank you. Thank you for liking and subscribing. You know what time it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Now break. Now we're cut.